If you've used a computer in the last 40 years, chances are this annoying little pop-up has invaded your screen relentlessly. It's McAfee, the most well-known and annoying antivirus program available on the market. Today, about 500 million customers rely on it to protect their computers from malicious software, and it made close to $3 billion in revenue in 2020 alone. Now, I bet you're thinking the inventor of this essential tech was probably a typical IT nerd who now lives a quiet, private life with his many millions of dollars. But that couldn't be further from the truth. John McAfee was a pioneer, inventor, and all-around coding genius. However, he led a life that was so unbelievable and bizarre, his recent obituary read more like an action movie plot than the life of a techie. From starting as an underdog to making hundreds of millions of dollars to becoming an addict, a fugitive, and running for president while running from the cops. And that's not even the half of it. So strap in tight because we're about to take a ride through the wild life of John McAfee. Let's start at the beginning, back in 1945. John was a British American, born on a U.S. airbase in Gloucestershire, England. His family moved to Virginia when he was young, but his father was an alcoholic and a bully. So John didn't have the best start in life, but that didn't stop him from developing a love of math. He excelled in the subject and eventually graduated from Roanoke College with a bachelor's degree in 1967. He then studied to become a doctor of mathematics, but in 1968, he was dropped from the course. While working as a teaching assistant, it emerged he'd gotten involved with an undergraduate student he was mentoring. That's a huge no-no for any reputable college. Even though they later got married, John's PhD was terminated. So, he decided to turn his hands to programming. He showed a major affinity for software development, and his career started to take off. He landed jobs with big businesses like General Electric, Simons, Univac, and Xerox. Around 1969, he was also employed by NASA to work on the Apollo program, meaning he helped put Neil Armstrong on the moon. But this was an age when companies were a lot more, uh, tolerant of employees using <clears throat> certain forbidden pharmaceuticals than they are today. And John was all in. The harder he worked, the worse his dependency on alcohol and addictions became. But it all got to be too much in the early 1980s after his wife left him. John had a huge meltdown while working for Omex, and the company swiftly fired him. According to John, this was the wake-up call of a lifetime. He began seeking help, got clean, and claimed in interviews that he hadn't drunk alcohol or taken an illicit substance since 1984. Although, considering the stories I'm about to tell you, I really, really doubt that. In 1986, John was working as a computer programmer at Lockheed Martin, the security and aerospace business who designed advanced tech systems for companies like NASA. He was working on a classified voice recognition program when an article in the papers caught his eye. It was about the terrifying spread of the Pakistani brain, one of the world's very first computer viruses. Anyone unfortunate enough to come across it would be greeted by this screen, which locked up their entire computer. Now, some of you are probably wondering, in an age before widespread internet connections, how did a computer virus spread? The answer was through floppy disks. For the 12-year-olds out there, these disks had just 1.44 megabytes of memory, about the same as one and a half minutes of an MP3 and were used to transfer data from one machine to another, like a USB stick, but with much less memory. Now, this brain virus worked by using a piece of self-replicating code that infected a computer before replacing the boot section of any inserted floppy disk with a copy of the virus. If it was inserted into another computer, the program would spread to it and infect any clean floppies fed into it, 
just like a virus would in humans. A copy eventually found its way to the U.S. and began to spread like wildfire. By 1989, it's estimated the brain hit more than 100,000 computers, with people using it to target places with huge computing hubs like universities. But the weird thing about this virus was that its creator's name and address was on the main screen, and it didn't destroy or delete any data. Now, I'm no tech expert, but if you created a virus with bad intentions, would you be dumb enough to put your actual name on it? Turns out, it was actually an experimental program designed by Pakistani brothers Amjad Farooq Alvi and Basit Farooq Alvi, who didn't make it to be malicious. It was meant to protect some medical software they'd been working on from copyright infringement, with the code preventing people from copying or sharing it without their permission. Unfortunately, this accidentally created the gateway into the malicious malware we see holding people's files ransom online today. At the time, John found the mechanics of the code both terrifying and interesting. He quickly figured out how the virus worked and created a program to neutralize it, before posting the coded cure on several online bulletin boards for people to use for free. People flocked to the posts in their thousands, and it was this that gave him an idea. Sensing a business opportunity, he started up McAfee Associates in Silicon Valley in 1987. Here, he developed his code into a comprehensive program called VirusScan that could detect, neutralize, and remove almost all viruses before they cause any damage. He was at the forefront of the industry, but he wasn't just driven by sales or money. John was genuinely passionate about making people aware of malicious software by doing things like driving around a mobile antivirus van and writing a whole book on the subject. Intentionally or not, the fear of viruses he drummed up drove virus scan sales through the roof. By 1990, he was making $5 million a year. In 1992, he went on TV to warn that 5 million computers could be hijacked by a virus called Michelangelo. It was the first public computer virus scare, and, predictably, there was a huge surge in McAfee purchases. With this, John decided to take the company public, making his shares in it worth an incredible $80 million. But it turned out Michelangelo infected a few thousand computers at most, and the resulting uproar tarnished John's reputation. He stepped down as chief executive in 1993 and was then forced out by the board of directors in 1994 selling his remaining stake in the company for roughly $100 million. However, McAfee was bought by Intel for a staggering $7.6 billion in 2010, making John's $100 million seem small in comparison. But even though Silicon Valley was done with John, John wasn't done with Silicon Valley. In 1994, he founded Tribal Voice, which designed the multimedia messaging system Pow Wow, one of the world's very first social networks. He sold that in 1999 for a further $17 million. Only then did he decide it was time to take a well-earned break. Though, what he did next surprised everyone. He bought 280 acres of land in Colorado, built an estate, and suddenly set up, of all things, a yoga retreat costing $25 million all up. In a bizarre twist, he transitioned from tech entrepreneur to yoga guru by writing not one, not two, but four guides on spirituality, as well as making several videos. But he quickly got bored with yoga and suddenly became obsessed with aero trekking, the practice of flying lightweight aircraft called trikes, just a few feet off the ground. It's a dangerous sport, so dangerous that it actually claimed the life of his 22-year-old nephew and another passenger under John's watch. The resulting $5 million civil suit that then landed on John's shoulders wasn't pretty. But instead of tackling it head-on, John planned to liquidate his assets and flee abroad, 
somewhere where the judgment wasn't valid. However, he didn't make a clean getaway. In 2007, the financial crash hit him hard. His $25 million Colorado home sank in value, and in 2008, it sold for just $5.7 million. Though, that was just the tip of the iceberg. Almost overnight, John lost approximately 96% of his wealth, leaving him with a net worth of just $4 million. I mean, that's still a lot, but he later admitted in several interviews that he had plenty of money squirreled away in secret bank accounts. So it came as no surprise that he quickly moved into a $5 million beachfront compound in San Pedro, Belize. In 2009, John delved into yet another startup, focused on a new controversial field called quorum sensing. Sounds like a yoga term, but it's the biological study of fighting bacteria, not by killing it outright, but by interrupting its chemical pathways. John claimed that the plants along Belize's Rio Nuevo River had properties to support this theory, and he set up a lab within his compound to test it. He established a company called Quorum X in early 2010 with the intention of producing antibiotics. But it was all a blatant lie. The science didn't make sense, and by October, investors saw his mad medical venture for what it was and backed off. Many believed it was just a cover for something more illicit going on in the test tubes. And it's around this time John went off the deep end, if you didn't think he'd done so already. Afraid of corruption and gangsters in Belize, John began building his own security force, mainly made up of criminals. They were heavily armed and loyal to John, who could pay them better than any local gang. Alongside them, he also assembled a harem of young, vulnerable women. Sickeningly, the youngest of all of them was just a quarter of his age, and by this point, he was 65 years old. The interviews these women gave to reporters many years later were so frightening, I can't mention them because YouTube would probably take this video down. Suffice to say, their stories aren't for the faint-hearted. Around this time, he also took to boasting on Russian forums under the username Stuffmonger about his experiments into MDPV, a chemical component found in bath salts that's also a powerful stimulant. He posted photos of his lab, his setup, and even his compound. There was no doubt he was dabbling in the drugged-up dark side again, and it was about to get worse. In 2012, Belizean authorities raided John's <clears throat> biotech research station after rumors spread that it was being used to produce illegal substances. Now, John claims he was approached by local politician Anthony Rayburn, who demanded a $2 million donation for his campaign. When John refused, the compound was raided by 42 armed police with dogs and riot gear. They confiscated weapons and substances, which turned out not to be illegal, and detained him for 14 grueling hours before releasing him. But that was just the start of John's troubles. He happened to live a few doors down from Gregory Fall, a U.S. national and sports bar owner. John said they hardly ever spoke, but Gregory had filed a complaint that year about McAfee's dogs, claiming three of them had attacked tourists and that the compound's residents were scaring visitors. Then, that same year, one of John's dogs died, apparently after several of them had been fed a purposefully poisoned tortilla. The very next day, Fowl's body was found, and without getting too graphic, it definitely wasn't an accident. It appeared a hit had been put out on the poor guy. The cops tried to talk to John, who was obviously a person of interest. But John was so convinced he was being framed, he refused to answer the door and hid out in the back of his property in the sand with a box over his head. Yeah, totally normal. Innocent behavior right there. Even though he was only a person of interest and not necessarily a suspect, John went on the run. He disguised himself as a ragged traveling salesman by wearing worn-out clothes, not bathing, and yellowing his teeth. 
He illegally crossed the border into Guatemala, leaving his life behind, but continuing to post updates to his website and Twitter professing his innocence. He even offered a $25,000 bounty for information regarding Gregory's death. While there, he contacted Vice magazine, who wanted to cover his story, but they accidentally released a photo of John with location data on, allowing the Belize government to track him down. It took no time for the local authorities to extradite him back to Belize for questioning. The manhunt was finally over. Or was it? Because John, ever the genius, managed to get in touch with his lawyer and asked him to file an appeal to have him extradited back to the U.S. instead. Time was of the essence, and so his lawyer frantically filed the appeal. John faked a serious heart attack to buy himself time. The ploy worked, and John was flown back to Miami. The same loophole he'd used to get out of the U.S. four years earlier had worked in reverse. John was a free, yet guilty-looking man. In 2013, he began to re-establish his presence in the U.S. as something of a celebrity. He decided to challenge the media's poor portrayal of him by uploading a parody video to YouTube called How to Uninstall McAfee Antivirus, which might just be the craziest video on the entire internet. Because his name was still on McAfee Antivirus, people were sending him thousands of emails asking how to uninstall it even though he hadn't been involved with it for 15 years. So, he read through their complaints while lighting cigarettes with $100 bills, being fawned over by beautiful women sucking their toes and indulging in bath salts. He finally revealed how to uninstall McAfee antivirus by shooting your computer. The message was clear. John was back, and just like McAfee antivirus, he was going to be impossible to get rid of. That same year, he returned to Silicon Valley with another startup company, this time to develop products that could make anyone invisible on the web, called Decentral. Then in 2014, he began dabbling specifically in smartphone tech and created Cognizant, an app that identified when companies were using your personal data without you knowing because you didn't read the fine print. Later that year, he went to DEF CON, a hacker convention in Nevada, and warned everyone there not to use smartphones, indicating all apps were designed to spy on their customers. It wasn't clear if Cognizant was included in that, but John's deep distrust of the tech industry was. After finding work with several other cybersecurity companies, 2015 rolled around, and John decided to level up once again. What does a man who's dabbled in tech, yoga, arrow trekking, substance abuse, and police evasion do next? If you had the answer run for president, then you're bang on the money. Heading up the newly formed Cyber Party, he launched his presidential bid for the 2016 elections. After a few months, he changed tack and switched to the Libertarian Party instead. Alongside other candidates, the party held its first nationally televised presidential debate, and John came in second in the primaries. He genuinely looked like he'd turned his priorities around for the better. But then that same year, he claimed he could write custom code for the FBI to get into the advanced encryption protecting the Apple phone of a wanted terrorist. Sadly, this was an all-out lie he admitted he'd cooked up, purely for public attention. Then a few months later in August, he was arrested for drunk driving while in possession of a firearm. I wonder if that was for attention too. Despite this, in 2016, he was appointed CEO of MGT Capital Investments, a tech holding company which he promptly tried to rename John McAfee Global Technologies. Big narcissism energy right there. However, Intel, the now owners of McAfee Antivirus, claimed they still had rights to the McAfee name. John had no choice but to abandon the name change, and instead shifted the company's focus from social gaming to cybersecurity. Soon after joining, 
John stirred the pot even more by claiming he'd exploited a flaw in Google's Android operating systems that allowed him to read encrypted messages from WhatsApp. He sent reporters phones and then sent them back their own WhatsApp conversations. The flaw seemed real. This was a major discovery, considering WhatsApp boasted more than a billion users, one that had the potential to put John's company on the cybersecurity map. However, it turned out he'd pre-installed malware onto the phones to make it work. So it wasn't really a flaw, just something he'd done to drum up more media attention. The press tore him apart, and John's credibility took yet another hit. After that, he shifted MGT's focus again, this time to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. It was another area of cybersecurity that fascinated him, so much so, he'd routinely stake his reputation on value predictions. In several tweets, he claimed one Bitcoin would be worth $500,000 by 2020, going as far as to promise to <clears throat> eat his own man meat on national TV if it wasn't. He then left MGT to head up cryptocurrency startup LuxCore and worked alongside the Skycoin project. He was so obsessed with cryptocurrency that in 2018 he posted a video on Twitter showing him getting a Skycoin tattoo on his back. If that's not advertising, I don't know what is. Though that wasn't the craziest thing he posted on Twitter. He tweeted later that year claiming to have, uh, no, let me check, I have the number right on this. Yep, 47 genetic children. Someone's been busy. But was his 2018 done there? Not by a long shot, because that June he made yet another bid for presidency. He ran as a libertarian again and campaigned for more extensive cryptocurrency use. Though this was probably just another way to get back into the spotlight, seeing as he was also charging $105,000 per tweet to companies wanting to promote their alternative digital currencies. Hey, what better way to drum up free media attention than run for president, right? He also promoted an unhackable crypto coin wallet called BitFi, which was then, embarrassingly, hacked. Headline after headline, John seemed to have his finger in every cryptocurrency pie out there, clearly making plenty of money as he did. And it was this that drew the attention of the US government, more specifically, the IRS. After a brief investigation, it came to light McAfee hadn't filed a single tax return from 2014 through to 2018. He'd allegedly hidden huge amounts of income from his cryptocurrency schemes, consulting work, and speaking engagements, but hadn't paid a dime of the $4.2 million tax. He was charged with tax evasion in January 2019 and decided to, once again, go on the run from the authorities. But instead of laying low, John happily confirmed he'd continue his run for president while living in international waters on a private yacht. Then he mocked the authorities, claiming he actually hadn't filed a tax return in eight years because, and I quote, taxation is illegal. I doubt the authorities saw it that way. In July 2019, he was arrested on his yacht in the Dominican Republic for entering the country with an illegal supply of weapons and ammo. And this would have scared the pants off most people, but John took it in stride, getting a few photos of his not-so-luxury jail accommodation before he was released after just four days. He continued to evade the U.S. authorities by moving around a lot, taunting them with his continuous online updates. Even when 2020 brought the COVID-19 pandemic with it, John kept posting, proving he was still living at large. At one point, he traveled to Norway via private jet to speak at an event and was arrested at the airport. You'd think it'd be because there was a warrant out there with his name on it, but it was actually because he was wearing women's underwear as a face mask. It turned out that despite being the founding authority on computer viruses, he was against the use of masks to prevent the spread of biological viruses, and was instead in favor of herd immunity. Despite the stunt, 
He was eventually released and continued to show off his luxury living situation online, like hanging out at a poolside villa and speeding off on a slick-looking motorbike. But then, all of a sudden, his high-flying life came crashing down. In October 2020, he was boarding a plane from Spain to Turkey. He was finally arrested on request of the United States Department of Justice for tax evasion. On top of that, his crazy cryptocurrency past caught up with him, and he was also indicted for fraud and money laundering for promoting certain crypto coins in a series of pump and dump schemes. These schemes involve people artificially inflating the value of an asset in order to sell cheaply purchased stock at a higher price, before dumping all their stock, tanking the value, and leaving other investors with nothing. John was alleged to have earned more than $23 million from his part in the schemes, yet more money he hadn't paid tax on. Oh, and for those who are wondering, Bitcoin's sale value never reached above $30,000 in 2020, a far cry from John's predicted $500,000. But as far as I'm aware, he never filmed an attempt to eat his own meat. No, that's the real crime here. John was detained in a Spanish jail for eight months, when in June 2021, the verdict came in. The Spanish National Court had authorized his extradition back to the U.S. to face all the charges. If he was found guilty, he could face a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. He'd have been 95 years old before they released him. It was then that John made a desperate decision, and a few hours later, his body was discovered in his cell. His lawyer claimed he'd taken his own life, a last stand of a defiance against the U.S. government. But the drama wasn't over. Several of John's tweets stated that if this happened while he was in jail, in the same manner as disgraced American financer Jeffrey Epstein, it would not be by his own hands. Even though an autopsy confirmed he had, conspiracy theories began popping up left, right, and center, claiming the government had assassinated John. To add more fuel to the fire, 30 minutes after his passing, a large black letter Q on a white background was posted on his Instagram page, the calling card of QAnon. These conspiracy theorists bizarrely believe that former President Trump is waging a secret war against a global network of cannibalistic, Satan-worshipping, democratic predators, and John was apparently on that list. So, wait, which was it? The government, QAnon, or one final stunt by John just to keep the media guessing? Well, I'll let the conspiracy nuts battle it out in the comments below. So let's recap. He was a mold-breaking and wildly successful cybersecurity legend who became too eccentric for Silicon Valley to handle, but his life was also entrenched in controversy, accusations, and stuff so dark I'm not allowed to talk about it. At the end of the day, there's no doubt that John McAfee's life, and even his demise, was absolutely wild. Though I have a feeling his legacy will probably pop up again. Do you think John was a hero or a villain? Let me know down in the comments below and try to dodge the conspiracy nuts if you can. Thanks for watching.